so many of you tuning in today for such an interesting and important topic. Um, my name is Kate Tarrant and I work for the Lower Blackwood Landcare Group. And for those of you that don't know us, we're a not-for-profit independent landcare organisation with an interest in sustainable agriculture and the broader environment and river health in the Lower Blackwood catchment. You can find out more about us and the work we do on our website at lowerblackwood.com.au. Um, before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of land on which we all live and work. I acknowledge the Wadandi Pibbulmun people of the Bibbulmun Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Just a few words about how our webinar will run today. Um, you may have noticed by now that you can hear us but not speak yourself. That is deliberate so we can keep things moving along at a good pace. You can definitely still ask questions though, so please don't be shy, just type your question in at any time to the chat box and I'll make sure it gets asked either during or at the end of the presentation. Also, um, if you do run into any technical difficulties, please, please use the status button, which is the hand you'll see um, on the bottom right side of your screen uh, to let me know. Uh, and I'll see if I can fix it from our end. Don't worry though, if you have to leave early or do drop out, we will be recording the session. I'll email, email a link out to that next week. Okay, to the reason we have all tuned in today, I am delighted to have talking to us today internationally renowned agroecologist, educator and systems thinker, Nicole Masters. Nicole has spent over 20 years working throughout Australasia and North America, coaching, consulting and advising producers on approaches, tools and thinking required to build soil and ecosystem health. Um, in 2019, Nicole added also to her list of accomplish accomplishments, um, publishing her first book, For the Love of Soil. It's a bestseller and has been described as a land manager's roadmap to healthy soil, revitalized food systems in challenging times. So if you haven't read it yet, you should. I guarantee it will become one of the most dog-eared books on your shelf. Um, we've asked Nicole today to talk to us about the vitally important relationship between plants and microbes and what it means for soil health. So Nicole, I'll leave it to you to take it away. Brilliant, Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. We were saying earlier, uh, we've been in the planning for this webinar for like two years um, in between, you know, dealing with COVID basically and not being able to travel. So my plan was to actually come and spend some time with you. I really love the Lower Blackwood part of Western Australia. You guys really are in quite a beautiful part of the world. So my topic today, and thank you, Kate, for that introduction. It's always um I don't know, it's always a little embarrassing having people introduce you, but um, I'm going to talk about microbial plant partnerships, and Kate has invited me to go quite deeply, but at the same time, this needs to be able to be relevant to our land management decisions, so I'm trying to relate that back into what we're doing on the ground. So my invitation is to please ask questions as we go along, um, and this is the question we're posing is, who are you farming for? So if we think about the communication between plants and microbiology, what you see above the ground, what is that trying to say to you? And what does that say about the management that you've been um, doing? So actually, this photograph comes from the Royal Perth Golf Club. This idea that farm resilience, it really does start at the roots. You know, so digging holes and taking a look at what's going on below ground and what's it trying to tell you? So the image on the right is what the golf course has been dealing with. There were in one cup of soil, six and a half thousand um, root nematodes in those soils. And what they're doing is they're basically causing that shearing off of those root systems. So you see what little roots are growing through are very small and stunted. And on the left, after a year of application with um, Landsat Organics, um, you can see that the roots are actually starting to get down through that layer and be able to suppress some of those nematodes but nematodes can be a really big issue on a lot of properties i think in australia it's costing you definitely over a billion dollars a year in lost production but just to dig a hole and take a look and ask the question of what is it that's what what's leading to these situations why is it that the plants themselves are even signaling to something like a nematode to say hey come and clean me up there's something going on so i really want to get into some of the some of the depths of the communication. So one thing I'd like to talk about is epigenetics. So you are 
what your mother eats, what your grandmother eat, what your grandfather ate, that environment that they were exposed to. And so epigenetics literally means on and above the gene. So the gene is, you know, here's two twins. They look exactly the same, but how their genes are expressed are not necessarily the same, right? It's the environment that determines how our genes are expressed. So one of them might smoke, for instance. Um, one of them might have had more stress in their life. And so we might see more diseases arising in the one that perhaps smoked or had more stress. Um, part of my interest for epigenetics is something that's happening with my own family. So this here is just a chance to show off, quite frankly. I quite like that dress. Um, my mum and dad and my two brothers. And my middle brother, Jeremy, has um, ankylosing spondylitis, so an autoimmune disorder that attacks the bones and the joints. He had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was 30. Um, and my youngest brother is Down syndrome. And that is a, a genetic change and alteration in the genetic code uh, or a mutation you could say what was interesting is we grew up on an air force base and we grew up next to the avgas refueling station um, and there were four down syndrome children born on that air force base to women in the early 20s and in, in this particular year and so something was going on in terms of altering how our genes were expressed and the impact that that's had so for me, when I was 15, I was poisoned with Paraquat. Those of you who have read my book would read my story. But I've met people who spray themselves in Paraquat and they're like, I was perfectly fine. I didn't get sick. Um, but for me, it was something that ended up having a huge impact on my life for a long time until uh, we managed to figure out how to get Paraquat out of my body. But a big part of that is because uh, I have a genetic defect in the methylation gene that basically detoxifies my body and that would have happened potentially in the womb so from ex my mum being exposed to chemicals that's altered my ability to deal with chemicals in my own life so I'm very very sensitive um, yes Laura this is the microbial lecture um, we're just looking at um, epigenetics so I want you to think the genetic code is the script so here are two different movies, totally different movies, but with the same script. So the script is Romeo and Juliet, uh, Shakespeare. They say word for word what's in that script, but yet how that movie feels and what it looks like and how much you enjoy it, hopefully. Some of you might enjoy the black and white version more than the color version, um, is totally different. So the DNA is the script, but the epigenetics is how is that script revealed? What is it? How does that express itself in the world? And that can totally change by different things that we're exposed to. So if you can imagine um, every single cell in your body has. Hopefully you can hear um, every single cell in your body is programmed to to be able to express itself as anything. But what happens is that cell will re receive some kind of signal, um, and it might be from in the body to say, this particular cell is gonna be a muscle cell, and this particular cell is gonna be a liver cell. So we have um, that gene is here, and it's covered by a protein sheath, and that protein retracts, and we see that gene expression switch on and that will in that retraction is what signals all right we're going to be a liver cell it means you don't have for instance um eyelashes growing in the middle of your eye like this just signals that this is going to be um an eyebrow um and that is turned on by the body or switched off all right so it depends so some of these cells are very fluid and some of them are really this is programmed to be like this and this is how it's going to be for the rest of your life but things like um aging uh things that might happen in the womb for instance so we can change and alter how a gene might express itself depending on the stress uh, your nutrition, the toxins that you were exposed to, or your parents or your great grandparents were exposed to. So many chronic illnesses or diseases like rheumatoid arthritis is when a gene becomes overexpressed or deregulated, right? And so then you don't have the ability to be fully mobile, right? So it's a switching on or a switching off. You either um, and it could be something like in your diet. So uh, the gene expression for rheumatoid arthritis could be switched on by inflammation, for instance. So it might be you're eating a lot of sugar. 
um, or something that's upsetting your body and causing inflammation, on switches that gene and now you have the expression of rheumatoid arthritis. There's some really interesting studies around early childhood abuse. So alcoholism, drugs, suicide, poor relationships are a response to some of that early childhood abuse, but it's because the body is not able to switch on the genes to deal with stress. So it creates different outcomes. So it's not because necessarily uh, you're comfortable or you've always been around abuse. It's that your, your body physically is not able to produce cortisol or serotonin or something in the body to help it deal with high stress. So there's things that we can do to alter that gene expression. So there's some beautiful research around the role of um, love or loving physical touches. So hugs, they did some studies with rats um, and the amount of times that a rat licked its baby actually changed um, its expression for health later on in life and its ability to parent. Um, and so the more that we we love on our children early on, then we can actually increase their resilience to stress and anxiety um, and see outcomes in terms of health and well-being. So they did a study, they've done a lot of studies on mice. I feel very sorry for mice. All right, so they did this one study where they exposed male mice to the cherry blossom smell, and then they electric shocked them multiple times. So every time they could smell the smell, they electrocuted the mice. And then they used IVF to breed uh, those males to females and then their offspring if they expose them to the smell of this cherry blossom they would shake with fear so that trauma was actually inherited through the gene that they remembered to be afraid of cherry blossom smell in this case but it's what sets us up for the environment that we're to be born in is that we are primed to know to be frightened of the saber-toothed tiger, for instance, that we're programmed to respond. And what was interesting is they could actually also deregulate um, that gene or that or desensitize those mice so they were no longer afraid um, through really, really good healthy diets. You could actually switch that gene off. Uh, some of you might have seen these agouti mice studies, the big fat mice. Um, but in this particular study, what they did is they mated um, a runt with the mother mouse and she withheld nutrients to her embryo because she decided that subliminally that mating with um, a runt mouse wasn't going to produce her very good babies so she didn't invest nutritionally into those babies so you'd think well maybe it was a runt male so it's going to have runt babies but they used ivf so when they used ivf and didn't expose the female mouse to the male mouse she produced normal babies so there's something going on in terms of even the thoughts that we have about a situation can alter the outcome so how does epigenetics relate to what we're doing if we're um, livestock producers so think of all the stuff on the left that's uh, that's influencing that gene expression. So it could be maternal stresses, um, mother behavior. You know, we're doing some things with dairy cows in terms of not having necessarily that mothering instinct, or perhaps because they don't um, need to because they're not looking after their babies. But how does that influence other gene expressions later on? Maybe there is a linkage with that with milk production or somatic cell counts. I I'm just guessing, I'm just saying. All right, so there's relationships with nutrition, pollution, um, my exposure to diseases and management practices. There really hasn't been a, a huge amount of work done in epigenetics in livestock. There's been some studies with pigs and some studies um, with cattle. But I've had this question posed to me from indigenous ranchers who are managing livestock who are like, well, what's the effect of low stress animal handling? What is it like if we don't stress those mothers out? If we're not if we're not ramming them into sheep yards or whatever it is that we're doing, does that alter how that gene is expressed? And then how does that alter um, behavior of animals further down the track? So I don't have the answers for that, but I think it kind of plants some seeds in terms of what are we doing with our management. There's been more and more work about epigenetics in plants, and in part because um, there are traits that the plants inherit for things like drought resistance and seed dormancy and even forming relationships with microbiology. Um, so we're seeing now plants that have been bred for long periods of time. So things like wheat species now and these wheat 
do not form mycorrhizal relationships and they don't form relationships with beneficial organisms like protozoa anymore. And part of this is epigenetics, right? So uh, exposure in the seed or exposure of the mother plant can actually um, exposure by with microbiology. So things like mycorrhizae um, or bacteria can actually change the epigenetic expression of that plant when it's sown in the ground and starts to grow, that can be incredibly beneficial. So how a plant is grown and where that seed is sourced can either be setting us up for resilience and nutrition or not. And so we're seeing breeders starting to focus more on these uh, epigenetic expressions because we can alter the stress, stress of those mother plants and that can set them up for seed that's going to be better able to deal with stress and that stress response or that gene expression to deal with stress can last for four or five generations so being able to um, produce a seed that we're like we know that potentially it's going to be drier it's going to be hotter it's going to be colder it's going to be wetter there's all these extremes happening uh, the seed producers in many cases are starting to do this thinking all right so thinking about how uh, the microbiology is on that seed so it might be um, considering where you even get your seeds. You know, are these seeds being grown in healthy soil environments or is the seed being grown in, you know, high nutrient environment with a lot of irrigation? Then perhaps that's not going to be a seed that's going to fit really well in with your system because you're going to have a compromised seed microbiome as well in this situation. So let's think about the microbiology under the ground. You know, we're all managing soil. Underneath the soil is more life than there certainly is above ground. You know, you might have um, one livestock unit per acre above the ground, and yet there could be four livestock units below the ground. And it's an absolute city under there. So there is um, hallways and uh, highways and corridors and elevator shafts and rooms and schools and hospitals and even a pub. Um, lots of pubs possibly, underneath the soil. And then that gives your microbiology places to um, be protected. It gives them places to hunt for food. Um, and this whole system is an interface in between the plant and the microbiology, right? And while the plants, are, um, while the microbes are all moving around underneath the surface, uh, it's totally dark, right? There is no light in here. And the only way that they can get around or know, are you going to eat me or are you my friend or am I going to eat you is through these receptors that they have on the outside of their cells. So there can be up to 100,000 receptors on the outside of every single cell. And it only takes parts per trillion to induce this gene expression response. So it might be an expression in terms of um, a microbe turning into virulence. It might be a signal to say, um, the plant is requesting some kind of nutrients. It might be to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm, we're going to work as a pack. We're going to hunt down this particular organism. So they've seen protozoa, for instance, actually working together to track down nematodes, um, totally doing this without any eyes. It's all about the chemical signals, and it's very, very minute signals. So when we're thinking about what's happening in the soil environment, it literally is parts per trillion of how little do we need to be um, interacting with the soil to induce some kind of response, right? And so plants have been doing it forever. So plants will actually call for help if they come under attack. So they, they will actually re release different types of signals. So the herbivore-induced plant volatiles are what they're going to use to attract insects from 60 feet away. And this will be specific signals for insects that um, are your parasitic wasps, for instance, they'll actually smell these signals. And then they have fatty acids that they are immediately releasing uh, that will attract different types of insects and last in the environment for different periods of time. What's quite interesting is we're seeing, uh, like with all the fires here in, um, in the US, that things like smoke and pollution from vehicles are actually suppressing plants' abilities to signal or even plants' investment in signaling. So even things like um, pollination or the smells um, of a beautiful flower, for instance, those plants are starting to invest less and less in those aromatics or what we call the volatile organic compounds because there's no payoff because those compounds are dropped from the environment um, with this, 
with the smoke or whatever it is, right? So plants are do using some of these um, compounds underneath the ground. So you guys would have heard a lot about some of the communication that the the root exudates that plants are releasing. So what's coming off plant roots all the time is like mucilage, things that's going to help to stick and make soils beautiful and crumbly and get those lovely rhizo sheaths. So those lovely dark root systems that we should be seeing on your roots. Plants are releasing soluble organic compounds. So sugars, amino acids, organic acids, enzymes, what we call secondary metabolites and some fatty acids, but they're also releasing these volatile organic compounds. So not only are they releasing the smells in the atmosphere, they're also doing that below the ground. And the reason for that is that it can move very well through the pores in the soil and signal to different types of microbiology, right? So different types of signaling metabolites. So we talk about secondary metabolites, or you probably heard that terminology. So a secondary metabolite means it's something that's not a primary metabolite in terms of something that's going to build like a leaf or a, a branch. It's what the plant's using to defend itself. There's a whole list of things there. A lot of these compounds are very important um, for human health. Some of them you'll be quite familiar with because they are what, um, oh, good question. Um, some of these signals um, are if we end up applying, um, not applying, but thinking about some of them uh, are our essential oils, things that give, fruit, vegetables, it's flavor. A lot of things are we use as drugs. So psilocybin, morphine, the opiates, all of those, those are all what we would call secondary metabolites. Okay. They are very important for things like UV protection and very important for helping plants defend themselves against um, pests and diseases. So Steve was asking, what happens if we apply too much signal? If we apply parts per million of something, um, it depends what signal you're, you're actually putting into the system. So what we find is microbiology can break that down or temporarily we see a drag on plants. So in some of the systems we're using perhaps two kilos of a vermicast or a compost extract per hectare. And what we found is if we put on 30 pounds or 30 kilos instead, that the plant will slow down photosynthesis because it's the microbes that feed first. And so we can get a slow drag on the plant and that effect might last a couple of weeks. So you want to be doing that monitoring for yourself to figure out how little do I need? And when you're thinking about enzymes or vitamins or hormones, very, very, very tiny amounts are needed to switch it, to switch microbial systems on or to overwhelm the plant. So many of you would have heard of the terminology of quorum sensing. Um, so the ability for plants to, oh, not for plants. So plants release these quorum signals, um, microbiology release it to each other. Um, it's been, I think it was first discovered in the 1960s, looking at bioluminescence. Um, bees and ants and birds in some ways use these in terms of how do we coordinate group behavior. But again, only tiny amounts are needed. And the other side of this is the quorum quenching. So think of a quorum as being a group of organisms, and it can be cross organisms. So it might not just be bacteria communicating to each other, but also fungi communicating to each other to turn something on or turn something off. So if we, oh, it's a bit hard to see. It looks a little blurry. All right. So if you imagine right down there in your root exudates, um, they're being pumped out through the roots of that plant and that plant's also releasing these plant volatile um, plant volatile volatile organic compounds sorry and there's microbiology that are responding and they're also releasing what we call microbial vol um, volatile organic compounds right and what's super interesting is that this works in harmony so the plant might be signaling to the microbiology and be saying hey i'm coming under attack or I'm um, feeling a lot of heat stress, they'll send out signals to specific microbes that can actually respond. And when they respond, they're able to stimulate that plant to release different types of metabolites. So they might be for biocontrol. So that might be the enzymes like proteinase or chitinase. They might be um, bioprotectants that 
induce systemic responses in the plant. So the plant's whole defense system fires up in response to these volatile organic compounds and the microbial communication signals. And all of this is what's supporting that plant and being able to tolerate stress. And what's super interesting too is that that's also contributing to things like nutrition and flavor profiles. So through having the more diversity of microbiology in that system, um, then we see more diversity in that plant being able to signal and then having a microbe that responds. And then that all turns into what ends up being for us yield and profitability, right? And it really is the biggest stuff that we're now facing globally is how do we create these systems that are incredibly resilient and resistant to stress? So if we look at trichoderma as one example, so trichoderma is a fungus that um, it eats other fungi, um, specifically more disease fungi. Um, it has been found to be beneficial and work with our mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and at times it can actually be a pathogen as well. So something to watch for is you want diversity in the system if you're using something like trichoderma. So it's a commercially available product. So on the left-hand side is a plant has come under attack from something like botrytis. The plant signals to the soil environment and it's trying to signal to trichoderma and there's no response coming back to the plant. Whereas on the right-hand side, there's a spore has landed on the plant. The plant sends a signal to microbiology. The trichoderma responds, releases these volatile organic compounds and we get this whole hormonal response, which is your salicylic acids, your abscisic acids, and your jasmonic acids that the plants use to defend itself. It doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in this absolute interconnectedness between um, microbes and plants. So think of it a little bit like um, the plant's gut system, its endocrine system, its immune system, all of that is outside of its body and it can't move around. So it has to outsource these things and it outsources that through having an intact microbial system, right? So what we find is the more we can enhance microbial biodiversity and biomass, that's where nutrition comes from. And I've said over 80% of plant health and nutrition is driven by biology, but it's it could be 100%. The more research that's happening in this, um, the more uh, TD is trichoderma. Um, the more uh, diversity, the more signals, the more resilience we get to stress, the more alterations in a plant's epigenetic expression. So it can now turn on that gene to be able to photosynthesize longer in a in a hot spell. Um, it might be able to be resistant to waterlogging longer because we've switched on that gene, for instance. So it's all a huge part of crop health and quality. So when I said over 80%, um, if we look at what's happening with the human microbiome right now, uh, they're now saying 100% of immunological disorders relate to the human gut microbiome. And so the breakthroughs that's happening with human health, I think really translates to what we're seeing with soil health. And we really are scratching the surface of this. You know, I feel like I'm doing a presentation where we there's just so much literature coming out and there's so much exciting stuff that we're doing on the ground where we're seeing these responses to very, very small amounts. So think about your seed microbiome. Um, so we have what we call the uh, vertical microbiome um, and horizontal transmission. So what comes from the mother plant is the vertical and what comes um, from the air or soil that that plant was growing in is going to inoculate that seed microbiome. And that's why I said it's so important to think about how is that seed growing um, before you purchase it and then uh, what setting are you putting that into. So absolutely um, soil primers, um, seed extracts, compost extracts, vermicast, seaweeds, anything that's going to really help to support that microbiome because that's where the nutrition is coming from when that plant first germinates and that's what sets that plant up for success for the rest of its life. Um, what are you asking? Even if it's dry, can we make a product to spray out pre-seeding? Um, you can spray something out potentially to um, over stubble as a digestion or down a liquid system. So if you are planning to seed something and you're planning that that plant's going to be germinating, then absolutely get something like this onto it. So you want to see when that plant starts to, to germinate that we get what I call the Rastafarian roots, but these beautiful structures. That is the difference between life and death, literally. 
But what we see is if you have um, an intact seed microbiome, a diverse seed microbiome, it's going to prime and then speed up that germination. Uh, take a look underground and what you'll often find is that seed might not have emerged yet, but you've got big root systems like this underground because the plant's not rushing to try and capture a whole lot of sunlight energy. It's got all the energy and storage that it needs in the seed and in its relationship with microbiology. Um, a big part of that seed microbiome is defense. So there's these volatile organic compounds again. It's helping that plant solubilize nutrients. It's fixing nitrogen and it's producing plant hormones. And if you got this from a seed company that's not necessarily thinking about the microbiome, then it may in fact contain pathogens. So it's something to consider um, in that process. Um, yeah, you could put molasses or fish down with this seed. Certainly Johnson Sioux compost. Um, when we're talking about all these different signals, you're better to have a diversity of those signals than try and guess what the what the plant needs. But certainly foods are going to help. So something um, cheap and simple like a molasses would be perfectly fine. Um, because they're asking good questions. Uh, yeah. And so this is perfect, Laura, because you just asked this question. Um, coating seeds. So if we're, if we're putting a neonicotinoid on a seed, um, that's having some major consequences on plant health and soil health, right? So they say 99% of neonicotinoids do not end up on the targeted insect. They end up in the environment, they end up in dust, or they end up with non-target insects and mammals. Uh, those neonicotinoids can alter over 600 genes in the plant, and those are the genes that are responsible for plant cell, def uh, for plant cell wall structures and plant defense. Um, so we're basically setting that plant up um, for, for the need for more products, right? It's a perfect sales pitch. Use this product, and then you're going to need more of that. And if I found some USDA internal memos. Memo? Memo? Memo. Uh, talking about... Um, the cost benefit of neonicotinoids and it basically said for every um, one benefit there's 99 costs for the use of this so really encouraging um, seed producers to stop putting neonic I mean I'm not one for banning or saying you should never or don't do this but this is one thing we need to get out of the environment um, so yes taking this off and instead we could coat the seed in some diverse microbial inoculants, Johnson Sioux. I absolutely recommend doing that. I kind of think if you're, you don't want to be putting naked seeds down, like um, they're going to need some kind of defense. Um, and then there's other impacts from those pesticides. So we find that the pesticides also reduce those secondary metabolites. So things that plants are using for defense and things that plants are using for communication to beneficial microbiology. So we really are undermining our soil health journey from the use of some, some pesticides um, and some of the herbicides as well. So you'll see that uh, the use of glyphosate uh, in the following year, we see a reduction in mycorrhizal fungi of about 25%, and that's compounding. So every year, we see less and less mycorrhizae with the use of uh, glyphosate. And it's not just because of the chemi ke chemical interactions, but the, the switching off of the signaling to beneficial microbes. Um, and also, a lot of these pesticides and herbicides bind to our minerals we need for defense, so things like manganese and boron. Um, and you can do this for yourself. You can get yourself like they're called a Hariba Twin Cardi pH or EC meters. And you can actually measure the sap pH yourself in your plants. And if you spray a fungicide, what you'll see is that the sap pH will dramatically drop after you apply a fungicide. Why does that matter? Well, the lower the pH, then the more attractant that that plant's going to be to either disease or viruses or things like red-legged earth mites are going to come in and clean that crop up. So you really want your sap pH at 6.4. It is the magic number. Um, and things like fungicides we see can dramatically drop that. So some of you might have seen the work of James White. Um, John Kempf did a great job but sharing some of his work, it really is worth going and having a look at Dr. James White's work on rhizophagy. But basically, the take home message is that plants are not vegans. Um, 30 to 100% of seedling nutrition actually comes from the absorption of bacteria at the root tip. So there'll be bacteria inside that, that 
seed if it's healthy um, and then as it starts to germinate and expand it's sending out sugars it's feeding microbiology and then it's absorbing that bacteria and it basically just explodes their bodies um, inside and it will absorb that nutrition so you think um, nitrogen so the amino nitrogen that's inside plants uh, inside bacterial cells is a very bioavailable form of nitrogen and that's where the majority of nitrogen is coming is actually from the bodies of these bacteria that have been absorbed at the root tip all right and so as that plant's taking up Oh, I've just realized I said hairy, dirty roots. You should never say that to a bunch of Australians, I don't think. That's for an American audience that don't think about roots the same way as you guys do, just saying. Um, but it's that absorption at the root tip that some of that bacteria is not killed in that process and it will travel through that plant and then re-emerge. And when it does that, it forms an irritation and that's where we get the formation of hairs on our plant roots. So we want to see a dense plant root hairs and it's interesting as we also see this um, as we increase the nutrition of a lot of plants we do see more hairs on the leaf surfaces so something to observe for yourself um, that's really helpful to reduce transpiration um, capture some dust things like that but while we're um, uh, while we're doing this with our rhizosheath we want to see these kind of systems be developed and this really is the difference for plant protection so if you can imagine the stress if you had naked roots and you've got the sun coming out behind a cloud that temperature can change dramatically for that plant and then maybe a cloud comes over and the temperature drops again or it's cold at night it's hot in the day that is all incredibly stressful for the plants and we see a reduction in photosynthesis and an increase of pests and diseases when this is happening um, so this rhizosheath gives us plant protection against climactic extremes um, and enables us to take up more nutrients. We're going to get better plant growth. We're going to see microbiology being fed in there. You are going to be building stable soil carbon further down, and that's going to be a protected carbon. We're going to see more resilience. And the pH difference can be as much as two units. So some of you that are on, um, say, saline soils, you might have a pH of nine. These plants can still grow in these environments, right? They might have a pH of seven and they have specific microbiology that are able to deal with um, those saline soils, including some types of mycorrhizae. Um, so the more that we can build that, then the more buffer that we have against stress. Um, and let's say you had an acid soil and maybe it's five, that plant can be buffered all the way up to seven through having that defense. Very good questions. Oh, is an ecofungicide potassium chloride bad for plants? Uh, yeah, I would imagine so. I haven't looked at what potassium chloride actually does to the leaf surfaces. Um, yeah, no, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, thinking about what we do to enhance these signals. So management is your number one tool. Uh, it can be the hardest part. You know, a lot of the time, maybe it's easier to get a product, but actually it's your management. So thinking about what you're doing in terms of avoiding cultivation, avoiding overgrazing. And if we look at the definition of overgrazing, it's the it's the repeat bite of a plant before it's recovered. You know, so it's not necessarily how much animals you have in there. It's about the recovery time for those plants. Um, avoiding things like waterlogging. What are you doing in terms of building soil structure? The use of soluble fertilizers, many of our pesticides, they all change those signals that the plant is sending. Because a lot of the time the plant might itself just barely be surviving it's not going to expend more resources and pay for services from microbiology if it's trying to just survive. All right, and we see different signals will change depending on soil types and if you have low organic matter. And I think you guys, you know, as a general rule, have slightly higher organic matter than some areas in Western Australia. Um, so what's going to disrupt those plant signals? Stress uh, and low nutrition. So if you have poor calcium mobility, and we get poor mo calcium mobility when you have low active fungi in the system. So we have beneficial fungi that actually um, provide more soluble calcium to the plant. Um, if you're low in boron, which some of you might be low in nitrogen or trace elements, I think often you guys probably have higher nitrates in the system. And we can see that if you've got a whole lot of capeweed growing, it's generally your indicator. And again, if you're thinking about plant signaling, um, 
they're also signaling to that seed bank. So who is it that's germinating is going to be germinating in response to whatever signal's coming. And that might be a climactic signal. So it's been really hot and dry for a long time and bared off. Um, we'll get a different type of signal um, when you get a bit of moisture, for instance. And then it's a biological signal, not necessarily a... Um, an environmental signal. So I wanted to share this image with you because I think doing small trials can be very insightful. Um, this is in Cotopaxi, Colorado. I'm pretty much based full time now in the US. But this trial here was in a field that's full of cheatgrass, which is a very invasive, um, shallow rooted, non palatable grass very bacterial soils. And what was growing in this field was cheatgrass and purslane. I think you guys have purslane. Um, and what they did is into one meter squared plots, they sprayed what was the equivalent of 35 kilos per hectare of a Johnson Sioux extract. And then they planted in a compost um, cover crop. So the cover crop went across all the fields and then they just tried, because they'd had a drought last year, they didn't really want to invest a whole lot um, into microbials or anything like that. Uh, they had, I think, less than three inches last year. Um, so I mean to say last year, the year before last. So this past year, they put down this treatment of Johnson Sioux. So they sprayed it. Um, they did a seed dressing and then they sprayed it on these patches. And what's so interesting is the only place that we saw the cover crop growing was where it had, had the extract applied. And then what was also interesting is they applied this into their meadows that they were tested biologically and were in really good biological shape and they had no response whatsoever. So looking at in your context, how much extract or how much stimulants required um, and do some small trials like this. We talk about like being safe to safe to fail, like how little do you need in order to um, create some kind of response? All right, and then what's driving these signals and what's driving that soil health is all of this diversity and microbiology. So starting to think, how can I get more perennials into the system? Um, because there's only so much that can be done if you just have ryegrass and clover and capeweed, not looking at anyone in particular, but I know <laughs> I've seen it. All right, so we want to see um, all these benefits from all these signals. Um, there's different health properties, but also thinking beyond the farm gate in terms of beneficial insects, the pollinators, um, being able to outcompete weeds, um, sharing mycorrhizae, and then having access to more water, to nutrient exchange, building humus, feeding microbiology, all of that stuff is an outcome of building more diversity in the system. So there's a question, uh, quite a few questions, all right. So what's the best way to increase calcium availability? Uh, one of the main organisms that's going to be supplying calcium is your fungi. So thinking, how do I feed more fungi in the system? Um, fungi actually do very well on legumes, um, but they do very well on chicory uh, and plantain. Sunflowers might be an idea. Sunflowers are really good mycorrhizal spreads. Any of our C4 plant species. Uh, so I think some of you are doing kaikuyas. Um, maybe not pastelums, but some think some of your palatable corn. Palatable C4s um, are really, really good at increasing mycorrhizae, which is going to help with your calcium. I'm a big fan of making like the old-fashioned whitewash recipe. So with burnt or slaked lime, turning that calcium into a liquid product and then applying small amounts. So I might do something like 10 liters a hectare to help stimulate and start to mobilize calcium. So often calcium is further down the soil profile and it's just about getting deep plant roots down there to help pull it up. Um, in my experience with capeweed, um, capeweed is often an indicator that you have a spike in nitrates. So it's making sure that you don't have bare soils, um, that you're feeding beneficial fungi again, because it likes very, very bacterial soils. Um, putting small amounts of biological foods, a little bit of calcium, something like that, just to help stimulate the germination of other plant species to compete with it as well. Um, and then, you know, it's grazable at certain periods of time. Uh, we've done some things like applying milk sorry i'm gonna sorry milk we've applied milk we've applied milk to cape weed at about four, 40 liters a hectare and seen some phenomenal responses it shifts the nitrate
profile in the plant and you can send it off to a lab if you want to have a look. And we see those nitrates being converted into um, amino acids and the plants actually then become much more digestible, which is kind of cool. Um, oh, so question, I'll go back. I'll leave that. Uh, so question on the best way. So if we're spraying Johnson Sue on plants, what's the best conditions to spray out and anything else in the tank with Johnson Sue? I kind of feel like if you're going to go to the energy of putting out a compost extract anyway and you've just invested your time, why not put something else out? So I might put a little bit of fish. I might put a bit of seaweed. I might put a little bit of calcium. Um, not generally putting trace elements unless I'm making my own chelated trace elements. So you, then we're putting very, very, very tiny amounts out. Like it might just be a couple of grams of a trace element and then it's not going to be so harmful. But the thing to think about with Johnson Sue or Vermicast is it's not necessarily the living component that you're putting out. It's all these metabolites. It's all the hormones and the signals and the enzymes that are creating this response, not necessarily um, a whole lot of living microbiology, which might be heresy for heresy, heresy? something for some of you. But um, yeah, it's about those byproducts to, to stimulate things. Um, I just want to talk briefly about pasture diversity in terms of animal performance. Um, dietary diversity, uh, is it's actually an animal welfare issue. So we're seeing some really interesting studies here in the US with Fred Brevenza and some of his team that is, some of them are based in New Zealand and they're finding um, if you are only feeding on ryegrass and clover, they're seeing an increase of physiological, oxidative, and nutritional stresses. Right? And these types of stresses are leading to things like mastitis, metritis, hypoglycemia, uh, retained membranes. And the more diversity you can get in the system, then they're seeing a response in terms of nutritional status, health, mental well-being, and ultimately welfare. So they were looking at different types of stress profiles depending on the diet these animals are being fed on uh, and their cortisol levels and other stress levels were through the roof for animals that were being fed purely on ryegrass and clover so let's not get the vegans more fired up let's think and I mean who really wants to just eat broccoli for the rest of their life you know just having that diversity out there gives them something to do as well um, animals do get bored um, I don't know what that question is Stephen about slates in soil do you want to um re-ask that question not quite sure uh i just want to question this idea of what we think of as rank feed so one of the things you might hear is when people go into more um, managed adaptive grazing or they start to control grazing more allow plants to fully recover is that there's a perception that that tall feed is rank and you're going to get less performance um, on an animal individual animal basis even if you're maybe running more animals but this is a biology and a nutritional issue, right? It's not just because that plant might be about to go reproductive, but it's the fact that you've got less nutrition in there. And that nutrition is driven by biology. It's driven by phosphorus, the amount of sodium you have in there. And I know some of you, you might be scared of sodium, um, but many of you in the Blackwood Valley area are actually deficient in sodium. So take a look at what's actually going on in your fields. Um, what is happening with sodium, it really does improve palatability um, and animal performance and then calcium again so a big part of this story is because of how those plant cell walls are structured so this here is a zooming in on that plant cell wall um, and in between you see all this gooey stuff this is what's called a pectin um, and pectins can be formed from magnesium pectins or calcium pectin and that will depend on the type of biology so if you are low in active fungi and you're low in mobile calcium, what we see forming are what we call magnesium pectates. They are very low in energy. They're very low in bricks. Um, you will see lower weight gains and lower animal performance. Whereas once we start to stimulate the biomass in the soil, we start to see calcium become mobilized to the plant. These shift to calcium pectates and they become uh, very digestible. Your bricks or your plant photosynthesis will increase um, much more palatability and you'll see animal weight gains and uh, milk production going up from something like that. So don't assume just because something is tall or heading towards reproduction that it's going to be necessarily less performance off that. 
Um, and so this is the role of fungi in this system. They form what are called calcium oxalates. So you see the fungi on the inside of that and they're forming crystals. Right, it's called geomycology, which is the formation of um, crystalline structures, but they also turn this into plant available forms as well. So fungi are doing this. Fungi are also getting into your rocks, um, into the silica, into the quartz of your sands or whatever, and turning that into bioavailable forms that are going to be beneficial to plant growth. Right, so do I have to plant multi-species cover crops? Right, we're hearing this a lot. Are we seeing a lot of multi-species cover crops? And I do think they're fantastic, but no, you do not need to plant a cover crop, right? It's going to be specific to your context. Um, we're seeing people that might have monocultural cover crops and maybe they can't figure out how to make a multi-species cover. Um, uh, or maybe you're heading into, you know, serious dry spells and you can't get germination, I want you to start to think, what signals are you sending for germination? All right, what kind of plant species do you see growing? You know, and if cape weed's growing, well, that means that other species potentially could be growing in there. Is that some, is that a place for chicory and plantain, perhaps? Um, but thinking about how do I introduce diversity and that diversity might be microbial diversity. So instead doing seed coatings, if you are running cash crops, um, thinking more about how do I get perennials into the system um, and maybe you know cover crops are a really good mix for you but um, yeah it's going to be case specific. Um, so last year we um, last year it's two years ago um, I spent two months up at Older Spring Ranch in Idaho. It's 46,000 acres. They're certified organic, certified regenerative organic actually. And they practice something called in herding. And if you look closely at the picture there, you see like um, in between those grasses is basically like a volcanic shale. It was this tough, it, was, it ground my horse's shoes down in the time that we were there. It was really, really, really rough. So we're basically in herding, which means we're moving with the cattle. Um, we move all the way out to a water source in the middle of the day and then come back in the evening on a different track. So there's GPS, um, I don't know, things in our saddlebags so we can figure out where we've been so we make sure we don't come back to the same place. So no ground is ever covered um, more than once in a season. And in some places, no ground is ever covered more than um, up to six, once every six years in some areas that are really degraded. And what's been fascinating is just to watch the huge amount of diversity that's coming away in response. Um, and many of these plants are edible, like so the, the livestock are actually eating them. But we did a, a, a plant growth survey and found uh, a 300% increase in ground cover and a massive increase in plant diversity. I counted 127 different species in two days while I was riding around. And I can't say I know what a lot of them were, um, but just the huge amount of diversity that's come away from um, animal grazing, right? And there were, what's also interesting, so this was the site that we did the comparison to, the Organic matter was lifted from 2% to 4.5% in six years, and there was this massive increase in ground cover and diversity, right? None of that was being done with anything more than animal impact, right? So thinking, how can I use animals to actually stimulate these signals and to stimulate soils back to life? Many of you will probably know Di and Ian Haggerty, and I only want to touch on one aspect of what wonderful work they're doing out there. Um, but and hopefully you guys know who they are in Western Australia. Sorry, just assuming everyone knows them. Um, but one of the things that they're seeing through the change in nutrition in their forage um, and the changes and in increases in microbiology is they're seeing epigenetic changes in the micron size in their wool. So their wool micron sizes are going down, not because of breeding and genetics, but actually epigenetics. So how can we change the responses um, in, in animals and in performance as we start to lift these plant and microbial signals, right? The animals above ground are responding. That Older Spring Ranch has probably, to, right, I like to rate my steaks. I'd say it's probably the second best steak I've ever had in my life. And the first best steak was Wagyu, so that doesn't really count. But um, it was absolutely incredible, the flavor profiles, and they are being researched at the moment. And I think we'll see some phenomenal stuff. So you are 
literally what your food eats. So thinking about that diversity of forage, thinking about supporting gut health of your livestock because they are in part what's inoculating these landscapes, thinking about the impact of stress. So stress um, can be positive, it can be negative. So a little bit of stress, we all need a little bit of stress, but not too much stress. How does that affect um, the progeny of animals that you're breeding? But gut health is one of the things that I see is massively significant and probably underrated in terms of its impact on building soil. Um, so I really like the use of humates, so free choice humates or a prebiotic or a probiotic in animal's water. Not only is it going to help you with animal health and performance, but then it also means they're excreting that out into the fields, attracting dung beetles, um, changing carbon to nitrogen balances in the soil, there's been some really good research on that. So thinking about what it is that you could put down with, um, with animals. So I just want to leave you with a couple of images and I thought we could have some time to have a chat. Um, this is from Kim Deans's, Kim and Angus Deans in Tinga, New South Wales. They've been running a regenerative property for 14 years. This was just after the fires in Tinga, so 2019. Um, 2018. Gosh, time's flying, isn't it? Um, and what I want you to see in this is that on this side of the fence line is Kim and Angus's, and on the other side of the fence is the neighbor. I don't really like using neighborhood examples, but I think this is one of the best fence line images I've ever seen. They had a, a torrential downpour. Everyone was celebrating. This was the first rain um, that really broke the drought. And everyone's celebrating because the dams are filling up. That's not a good thing. You don't want your dam to fill up straight away. It just means that the water's running off. So you see there's literally a lake forming on the other side of the fence line, even though this ground is totally flat. Whereas on this side, um, the water's infiltrating straight in, except in areas that were really, really burnt out. And then when the winds came up, this was the effect um, that they saw in the property, is what's holding those soils together and stopping them blow away or wash away is... Um, microbiology, right? It's the, the glues and the waxes and everything that microbes use to stick together actually holds the soil together. So literally the dust storms start on the neighbor's fence line. I think that's one of the best, best fence line images ever. So thank you, Kim and Angus, for those. Um, incredibly inspiring. So much of what we're dealing with these days is soil issues. If we're talking about flash flooding or droughts, um, we're talking about so so many even climactic issues all come down to how are we managing our soil resources. So how do we really lift our plant and microbial signals? It starts with the plant. So ensuring that your plants are healthy, they are uh, photosynthesizing optimally, um, reducing plant stress, and that might happen because you've done a seed dressing. Check out if you have any major macro or micronutrient imbalances, especially in transition, and maybe you're going to apply that as a foliar, but just support those that plant health. Then use practices which are obviously going to be building carbon. So that might be your grazing management, avoiding cultivation. Uh, if you are using nitrogen or herbicides, that you're going to buffer those with some kind of carbon foods. Um, and then how do we feed those microbiology? So putting different diversity of foods down. And then thinking diversity, diversity, diversity. So if that is cover crops, um, but, you know, can we get alley crops in? Can we get fodder species in? Just really thinking beyond the two dimension in terms of what we're doing. So, um, Kate, I would be happy just to have a chat with everybody if people wanted to chat. She's run off and left me. <laughs> I am here. Well, that was pretty comprehensive. And you did take a deep dive, as you said. <laughs> There's so many things. You asked um, for it. It's your fault. I, I did. I did. I did. You did. Um, uh, while we're, we're waiting for people to sort of formulate their questions, I'm sure there are out there thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I might just ask a couple of, of my own. Um, so, can we in close our that image? Is that possible? Can we just yep. have you and me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is a cool technology. I really like it. <laughs> um, so, in our context, um, high rainfall. Um, but Mediterranean zone, um, mm -hmm. and you've got a grazing land, grazing farms that have got mostly annuals. Um, what would you say would be a good step approach for people to take if they want to start to um, improve 
their own plant microbial relationships in their own pastures. I do think using animals as a tool is a really good, should we call it a gateway drug? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's something that, um, you know, if, if, rumen, if the rumen's dysfunctional, then you're, you're again not feeding the microbiology in that process. So really looking at, you know, looking at manure, for instance, you know, is that cow pie really, really healthy? Have you got thousands of dung beetles and if not why not and starting to ask those kind of questions because there's there's someone that's out there every day spreading stuff so if you can get them to spread something that's really healthy we've noticed that operations that are um you know just turning over and fattening cattle and bringing animals in say from the yards where they have no relationship with that landscape and often their gut is compromised we don't see the same responses in the soil as people that are keeping their own cows and calves and, you know, keeping some animals on the property that potentially as they move, and I always think of the bison like this, you know, they're moving with just this wave of microbiology that would have been around them that they're taking through. Um, through. Thanks, Laura. I appreciate that. Just reading a question. <laughs> Um, it was interesting what you were saying about um, um, the use of, um, well, using your room. Graham, actually, Graham Hand, we, um, a grazing trainer we had over a couple of years ago, pretty much said that that's the most economic way you can improve your soil is use your use your rumen, ruminants as a inoculant. Um, and I, I yeah. think it's really interesting the idea of using free choice home, humates and uh, and um, and or mm. uh, probiotics. And in fact, one of our one of our dairy farmers down here, one of our largest dairy farmers, he uses probiotics and he says he's had great gains in production just and, and cow health just with that, which is great. Yeah, and you don't need to buy these. Like A lot of these um, prebiotics or probiotics are really expensive. You can make your own. So, like, the practice for natural Korean farming of a lactobacillus brew, really easy to make. Um and you can just add it into a trough system at like one to a thousand or one to 10,000. So hugely concentrated uh, and make it yourself. So I think there's lots of options for things that are prebiotics. Um, I don't know how expensive humates are, but some people are using biochar. Oh yeah, yeah keep the grains. Cool. Yeah. <coughs> That'd be kind of yeah, cool. Might have mm -hmm. to look at it. And um, just, just for our um, audience's benefit, I, I, we talked about Johnson Sue a lot, and I'm not sure if everybody knows what Johnson Sue um, compost is. So I might look at mm -hmm. um, seeing if we can get Dr. David Johnson or someone on a webinar. Oh, you least, should totally do that. that at least a session. Yeah, I think it would be good. Mm -hmm. um, it's really fascinating. Um, so we have some questions, yeah. other questions now here. Um, Keen to hear if you have any ideas, recipes for a soil primer, stubble digestion, microbial stimulant, somewhat that does a similar thing to say BD500. Why aren't you using BD500? <laughs> cheap, very cheap. Um, yeah, if you think about, if we're thinking about stubble digestion, you know, there's four main ingredients we need to break stuff down. One is sugar, uh, one is calcium, you need a little bit of phosphorus and a little bit of nitrogen. But we find um, if you, you can make a recipe out of those four things pretty cheaply, you don't have to, we're putting small amounts on, right? Like a couple of kilos. Um, uh, yeah, maybe up to 10 kilos for calcium. But think, you know, if you're going to put some sugar on like molasses or just sugar, it, it, I would be using like less than a liter per hectare. I like making or stuff or supporting people and making things. I just want to make it clear I'm not consulting anymore. So um, we're really focusing on coach the coaches training schools right now. Um, so yeah, I feel very separated right now, sitting in my office in Montana, talking about practical things and I've been sitting in front of a computer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be a great stubble digestion. Doesn't have to cost a lot. Um, yeah. Um. What and this is a good question because it's sort of what my I was thinking as well from Brett. Um, what do we do in our summer to keep ourselves alive, given that we mm -hmm. have not much rain? Yeah, and part of that issue is that there's nothing growing when there would have been stuff growing naturally, and so I think look to this stuff growing right, the cape weed's growing, the gum trees are growing, um, the 
tree grasses. The flat uh, weed. Growing. So there's, often, there's often flat weed out there as well. There's often growing. a flat weed. And there, there might even be a thistle out there. So trying <laughs> to, and I had this conversation with some Californians that Mediterranean climate, nothing's growing. Uh, lots of thistles though. Um, and we got chicory and plantains growing like gangbusters on, on these properties. So if something is growing, then try and find this what other species are out there, you know, and I think you guys have a lot of C4 grass species that um, that potentially could come back. But right now you're not sending the signal, you know, the perennials seem to be a little bit more delicate about the kind of biological environment that they like. So right now you're sending a signal for primitive, simpler, weedy type species. And so the perennials aren't going to get going. So that's where doing a seed dress thing is going to be really, really helpful um, and supporting more drought resilient plant species that would have been there naturally. I mean, I know you had a lot of forests in, in your area, but there also would have been a mosaic from fire, am I guessing? I mean, there yep. might have been open areas and potentially grasses in a further north. There's certainly really good record. Um, I mean, Christine Jones can probably speak about some of the grass species that would have been around, but what can you do to create the soil environment that causes those species to want to germinate? And right now what you're creating is what we call a compounding vicious cycle downwards as you now have bare ground and that just sets, it sets that whole system up so that we don't have very good ground cover. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. Yeah. Um, okay, more questions. Uh, the, actually, this was asked earlier, so I guess we need we need to uh, answer it. Do you have any experience in using wood vinegar? What's your opinion on it? I'm not sure what it's referencing. Um, I haven't really used it. It's a byproduct of like biochar and pyrolysis, like so the breakdown of organic materials. But um, no, I haven't had much experience. I've, I've read a little bit of literature that looks pretty good, but I think probably someone else might have some experiences. Um, yeah, and that's where, you know, doing some of these growth trials, so, you know, coating seeds in some of these products and seeing for yourself what germinates. Do you get 100% germination of the plants that you want or do you see a whole lot of weeds turning up? You know, there's some really simple things you can do without having a microscope. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, and so question about best ways to lift bricks. How quickly, quickly mm -hmm. can we lift it? And does flood irrigation kill off dung beetles? Yeah, <laughs> flooding is probably going to drown your dung, dung beetles, just saying. <laughs> um, but, yeah, there are, I mean, there's three main groups of dung beetles. You know, you've got your tunnelers and your dwellers and your rollers. So the dwellers themselves, um, they can fly like two and a half kilometres. So if you have, if you've switched off that flood irrigation and you've got cow pies, you've just had, you just raised that, um, they will smell that signal and they will fly in. So, um if they've disappeared, there's still you should still be able to attract them back. And it's amazing how far they can smell and, and turn up, which is really cool. Um, so the best way to lift bricks is to really figure out first, why is your bricks low? So if your plant's not photosynthesizing very well, is it stressed? Um, doing some, you know, sap analysis or leaf tissue analysis to have a look at what what is the limiting factor on that? Um, you know, and it could be a trace element, it could be boron, it could be manganese, um, it could be phosphorus. I suspect and for many of you there's phosphorus issues. Those issues are all biological, right? But you're in this catch-22 because it's the plant that feeds the biology and the biology feeds the plant, but you've got um, low photosynthesis. So that whole system is, um, yeah, kind of stalling. So you, you really want to get into your diagnostics and try and figure out why is it that that's happening so um those of you that have read my book a couple of you said that's really cool thank you um i use what i call the five m's so thinking about it in terms of is it a mindset issue maybe is it your management is the reason why uh, your bricks isn't doing very well is it a mineral imbalance a microbial balance or low organic matter All right so using those five insights into to, into trying to diagnose why your bricks isn't doing very well so one thing I recommend, um, oh, there's this good questions happening. And one thing that uh, you could do is just to set up one square meter by square meter trials uh, and get a little spray bottle and spray different types of biostimulants.
that might be a bit of milk or molasses or fish or seaweed or compost extracts. We've talked about all of those things today. Um, and uh, then test those plots and see which one of those is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Um, and yeah, we've done some different stuff like this in, in the Blackwood area um, and found, yeah, some, okay, I don't want to share too much. It's, it was interesting what we found. I think if you can figure out what in your specific context might work well, but milk might be one of those ones that you might want to chuck in. So if we said 40 liters per hectare of milk, that ends up being 40 mils of uh, milk in a, in a spray bottle for a, a meter. So divide whatever you've got by 10,000 to get your rate. Oh, so maybe it's four mils. I don't know. Someone do, who's good at math, do the math. And actually, we've got um, a few dairy farmers on this webinar. So perhaps that's something they can try. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us what they could try. They could, they could share it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, just sort of a slight aside, um, farmers that are trying to transition, say they've used high input fertilizers, let's stay away from the chem the, pest, the chemical side of things, but just, look, uh, sorry, the insect side and um, mm -hmm. side of things, but just talk about ferts. <clears throat> Obviously, it's not going to work just to not, just to suddenly stop adding. Yeah, don't ferts. do that. <laughs> because um, there's no, do your biology isn't there to help feed the plants. So if you take away the other source of food, then it's not going to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so this is where um, that whole be safe to fail thing comes in, you know, like be able to be able to experiment in areas, you know, if it's your grazing, have an area maybe that you don't graze on this rotation and then come back with a heavier impact on the next rotation. Like just mix it up a little bit so you can see, you know, what would happen if I did this before you convert full hog. Um, things like nitrogen, you know, our nitrogen use is incredibly inefficient. You know, globally, I think 95% of nitrogen that's applied goes up in the atmosphere or out in the waterways. Even if you're a really good dairy producer, you're probably still only using about 35% of that nitrogen that you're applying. And the rest of it, it's literally like you're setting money on fire, especially with the cost of nitrogen this year. Um, so one thing we recommend is to buffer your nitrogen with some form of carbon. You guys do have a black urea product. You do have um, granulated nitrogen products that already have a humate on it so a concentrated carbon but what that carbon does is it feeds the microbiology and it enables that nitrogen to be slowly released so instead of having a nitrogen that's available in a month you've got a nitrogen that's available for six to nine months um, so i think starting to go all right how can i feed more microbiology in here how do i buffer what i'm currently doing and and so we find there's a 30 to 60% increase in nitrogen efficiencies by adding in a carbon. So it means you can drop your nitrogen, say, by 30% with no change in yield. And that, that would be something I would say is a low-hanging fruit. Drop your nitrogen by 30%, get a carbon source in there, start to feed biology. You'll save some money. You're going to grow better quality forage. You're feeding microbiology. Like, it's a win-win-win, that one. Um, and, Yeah. Yeah, I think I think nitrogen is probably one of the easiest ones to yeah. just transition and save some money. <clears throat> yeah. But getting diversity in is is key, and diversity really is what's going to help increase your fertilizer efficiencies as well, and just and, and reduce your your vet bills. Yeah. Um, and just uh, aside, uh, um, Greg, who was asking about the wood vinegar, says um, it, he says it's relevant in this area because wood vinegar, wood vinegar and smoke seem to be the essential to stimulate the germination of our native perennials because they've evolved mm. fire. Oh, wow, that's wild. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Mm. That would make sense. Um, yeah, and if there's acetic acid in it, then it is um, a microbial stimulant in one of their signals when we're talking about signals. So that's cool. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. And Roz has pointed that as well. Thanks, Roz. So she says, is it a byproduct of my... Is acetic acid a byproduct of some microbiomes? Mm hmm Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, thanks for existing, Jen says. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jen. I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you share any research articles uh, that support what you said um, about the need for sodium and plant function? 
I've heard mm-hmm. about it from other soil nerds. I oh, know she's called you a nerd, but hasn't um, <gasps> <laughs> but haven't really found anything to support in academia except for sodium replacing potassium with stomatal opening. Yeah, so sodium sodium's not considered a plant growth growth element, but it is required by every single living organism on the planet, which includes all of our soil organisms. So we're doing it for soil life. Um, so a lot of soil life is impaired because there's a deficiency in sodium in these soil systems. But what we see is a little bit of sodium lifts palatability. It lifts digestion. So animals need that sodium for rumen function or for digestion. Um, and if you put a little bit, try it, try it out in the field. If you use a little bit of sea minerals, sea water, you guys are close to the sea, just saying, um, you could put some seawater on and what you'll see is where you've applied that livestock will preferentially graze it so it's more around palatability um and you can also see um lifts and bricks when we apply it and that's not due to plant stress right um so yeah do some of these little trials for yourself yeah. thanks Roz. <laughs> thanks jen so nice you guys are lovely i miss the australians oh god no australians <laughs> to hang out with <laughs> well uh, oh no someone's still timing uh can you please come to wa and play on our farms yeah well i've already asked for that. <laughs> maybe when COVID disappeared <laughs> um yeah. well yeah. it looks like we come to the end of our questions um and as always fantastic nicole such a critical subject um we've got so much still to learn about um and uh, for those of you that don't know, this project, this webinar actually forms part of our current project, Pasture Biodiversity to Build Soil Health and Resilience in the Lower Blackwood. So it's very appropriate. Um, and that project aims to demonstrate the efficacy of multi-species and perennial pastures plants as a means to improve our drought resilience. <clears throat> so um, there's lots of lessons in here for me in terms of informing the project, which is great. Um, and uh, Nicole did um, reference um, James White and Rhizophagy, and um, I'm not sure if all of you saw my newsletter, last month's newsletter, but I did put some links into his work there, so you might want to go and have a look at that. And also some of the things that Nicole's talked about, she also has in her very excellent blog on her website, so, you know, yeah. you can go there at any time. She's, um, she's always adding great stuff for that. And, of course, her amazing book. We'll give that a plug. Give <laughs> the <laughs> get the book <laughs> and it's also on um audio so i find yeah. a lot of people find audible easier I, I must say i'm digesting most books these days on audible yeah yeah it's good Thank because you. um we we've done a, we've done a podcast with you and nicole in the past on compaction which is great and it's on <laughs> our website for people um or on apple um so audio is great because you can listen to it in your tractor or when you're out working in the farm so it makes it really easy um, so I think thanks once again, Nicole. We'll let you go because I'm sure no it's, your dinner time. it's your dinner time. I think I heard someone in the background preparing yes. your food. Yes, you did. <laughs> Hopefully. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, we wish you all the best for the coming year and I hope to see you out here again sometime in the not too distant future. Oh, thanks, Kate. Thanks for you know the, the long road and organizing this. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And yeah, I miss you guys. But yeah. Have a great day. Happy growing. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and for um, for everybody else, um, before you run away, <laughs> um, thank you so much for tuning in. And um, if I can ask you to complete our webinar evaluation form, that would be fantastic. Um, it's only a few minutes and it's super helpful for us in making sure we are providing all the content that you want. Um, so I'll leave this webinar room open for a little while so that you can um, you can fill in the webinar form. Thanks very much, everybody, and see you next time. Oh, actually, um, I'll be announcing our next um, event in the newsletter, but we've got a Soil Health live face-to-face workshop coming up in March, so stay tuned for that. Thanks, and um, enjoy the rest of your day.